I have a very, very special guest today. So special, in fact, that dogs stop barking when he walks down the road. Birds fall from trees in anticipation. Um, he's an oracle. He's a uh, prophesier. Um, today's guest is a predictor of, of the future. I'm delighted to be joined by Daniel Franklin. Daniel, welcome uh, to uh, uh, OglevyDo.com. Lovely you. to have you here. Pleasure. Pleasure to be with you. You are the uh, you're the editor of, of the Economist. Executive editor. Executive editor yeah. of, of the Economist. You also, um, for the last nine years, you've been responsible uh, for the publication of the World In, the, the, the predictive annual. Um, uh, uh, report feature yep. that, that, that is produced. Daniel, you, you've got to help me here because every, um, ev every conversation that I have with, with CEOs and, and with businesses generally, it is more difficult than ever before for them to predict of the next quarter of how their business will be. Um, is that just because I'm speaking to the wrong CEOs or, or, or are you finding as you sit and you think of, of making those predictions over the last decade, is it indeed getting more difficult to predict? Yes, I think it's been harder through, ever since really the economic crisis. I think that's been a, a pe peculiarly difficult period. And in fact, this year, um, 2013, is, is a, a tricky one for, for, for a couple of very clear reasons. One is uh, the famous fiscal cliff in America. Right. So we know that's coming up. Um, we know that if nothing is done about it, the outlook is fundamentally different. Uh, and depending on what, what is sorted out or not sorted out, um, the U.S. economy, which is so important to, um, to the world, but uh, not least here in, in Asia and Singapore, which is an open trading economy, what happens in, in America is, is vital. Um, so that's one huge immediate uncertainty hanging over the, 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 the economy. And I think there are many businesses... Um, in America and elsewhere that are just holding on to wait and see what happens. It's very hard to make, uh, in many cases, investment plans when, when this degree of uncertainty is just in front of you. Right. Uh, and the other huge uncertainty is the euro. Um, right. and, and although it's less acute than it was, I think the, the danger that the euro will collapse imminently has, has more or less lifted. Right. But there is an ongoing sickness there that, that is far from being cured and is very vulnerable to something going wrong at any point in the coming year. So whether it, was, whether it would be an uh, uh, explosion on the streets of Athens or uh, another uh, surge of nationalism in, in Catalonia, it could be any number of, 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 of surprising events as a result of the tensions in, in the Eurozone, right. an economy which is in recession. So I think both those things together do create an unusual degree of uncertainty. And then you layer that over with political uncertainty, uh, with the transition in China, for example, with elections happening in various parts of Asia. So I, I have some sympathy for those who say, you know, it's, it's hard to see very far ahead. Yeah. So as far as the, the 2013 predictions are concerned, as businessmen sitting ac across Asia, what are some of the, the big pillars that we should be mindful of? Uh, okay, well, I, I think the, the, um, uh, the broad picture is, is one um, actually not that dissimilar to the one that we've seen in, in recent years, of very uh, divergent pictures in the emerging world and the rich world. So right. uh, as we were talking about just now, recession in, in, in Europe uh, for the year as a whole next year. It, mo it probably looks more or less flat. Uh, America, actually, I think there's a bit of upside if you get, once you get over the fifth fiscal cliff, and I think, by the way, that the likelihood is that they will right. find a way to, na to navigate that. Then maybe things will, will look up, and particularly by the end of 2013, there's there's a, um, a chance that America will really be surprising on the upside. Right. But nevertheless, if you take rich world as a whole, it's probably less than 2% growth, emerging world 6% or so. Right. So that's the, the, the starting point that is guiding many um, executive decisions, I think. The, right. uh, the action is in the, in, in the emerging world. China continues to be uh, particularly important to that picture, but not only China. Um, mm. If you look, at, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in Africa, perhaps the second fastest growing region uh, in the year ahead uh, after, after Asia. And then I think for those with, with real discerning eye, there are sort of pockets of really rapid growth um, that are sometimes in quite exotic places, um, but those can be interesting for the adventurous.
Looking at Asia, I think ASEAN is, is coming together and having a voice um, more than ever before. Are you seeing a greater importance across ASEAN? Well, I think the, the, the various economies of the region are particularly interesting. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that as a club, uh, ASEAN has particularly uh, more clout than, than it has had in the past, at least to the, outside, to the outside world. But I think it's certainly the case that if you take um, uh, the Asian giants, there are some emerging Asian giants that have been less in the spotlight in recent years that are doing very well. Right. Um, and there's almost a bit of a competition now to be with, with India um, struggling a bit and India's growth rate dipping down to perhaps 6% or so. There are other giant Asian economies that are becoming very interesting as possibly wanting to become the, the, the race to be second, if you like. In that context, I think Indonesia is particularly interesting. Mm. I mean, Indonesia next year probably crosses the threshold of a quarter of a million people. It's, if the bricks were invented today, they probably wouldn't be bricks, they'd be bickies. Right. So you'd probably <laughs> have Indonesia <laughs> rather than Russia. And the Philippines as well, which has had remarkably steady uh, growth uh, uh, over the years. And then, you know, you mentioned ASEAN, I mean, Myanmar, it's still, I think, not for the faint-hearted. We've only just had the new... Uh, foreign investment law and there are a lot of uncertainties still there but clearly there's there's uh, exciting prospects uh, ahead if, if things continue to go reasonably well on the political front. If Groucho Marx were remaking the the go west young man um, it probably would be go east young yeah, man now definitely. I mean it was uh, um, I was surprised I don't know if you were surprised um, Daniel about the fact that no sooner had um, Mr. Obama been been restored to uh, into the White House then he sort of said, Michelle, pack your bags, uh, we're, we're going east. Yeah. I mean, it was just incredible, his speed, uh, and obviously wanting to be in. There was an ASEAN summit, yes. there, and so that, but it was interesting that he went to Myanmar, which yes. was, you know, obviously an important political statement. Uh, but he has actually deliberately made a lot of the Asian pivot, mm -hmm. uh, and I think in, in the second term, it'll be a sort of pivot plus. Right. Um, you'll see more of that. And actually... Uh, second term presidencies tend to get drawn into foreign policy more and more so right. I think Asia will one way or another be occupying more and more of, of Barack Obama's time and of course above all actually it's the relationship with China right. that is going to define that and, right. and, and uh, you know the, the two greatest economic powers now in the world uh, with a new leader in China that's an absolutely critical relationship and, uh, and there will be a certain amount of testing and seeing what does the new generation of leaders in China actually mean? Will there be uh, a change of direction of any sort? I think there's a, a general expectation of continuity, but new regimes are never quite the same as the previous one. Right. India will by, and I think it's 2020, be the most populous country? Yes, I mean the demography of, of Asia is, is changing very rapidly. India has a relatively dynamic demogra demographic out right. outlook. And China, I think 2013 may be, some, some people estimate, the year when, when the, the labor force starts to shrink. Right. Uh, so that's a sort of mind-concentrating first sign of the sort of uh, demographic challenges that China has ahead. It, it will aging be population. very rapidly right. aging, po very, very mm -hmm. rapidly aging po population. So yeah. by 2050, actually, China is going to be, have an older age profile, not just than, than America, but Europe as well. Uh, and Europe is old enough, so um, it, it, it really is in this race to get rich before it grows old. In terms of business, um, Daniel, do, do, you, do you believe that um, businesses in Europe and in the States, that they fully comprehend the, 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 the challenge or opportunity associated with Asia? Well, I think some do, because some are very, very um, active in, in Asia and, and put a lot of emphasis on it. Uh, but I think clearly many still don't and I think it, 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 it's uh, somewhat worrying to me mm. that Europe in particular is going to be preoccupied with its own issues of keeping the euro alive, constitutional change, uh, sorting out yet again the, the institutional arrangements for Europe. Um, in other words a very inwardly focused set of concerns while the real action is taking place elsewhere and that, that has to be a, a concern. Right. You had a conference uh, earlier this year in Silicon Valley, the, the, the ideas economy, mm -hmm. uh, which I believe was looking at innovation. 
yeah. um, and looking at stimulating business. Do you see the next Silicon Valley, whatever it might be called, somewhere in Asia? And I I in order for that to happen, uh, what's the secret of Silicon Valley's success? I think one of the peculiar things that, that is hard for Asia to, to replicate in certain parts of the region anyway is the, the effervescence of ideas and the freedom of, of association and expression. These are people you know, colliding, ideas colliding with each yeah. other with, at great speed with, with great abandon. And that's something that in certain political cultures um, it's different, difficult right. and it's irreverent and it breaks up, it disturbs the status quo in a way right. that, that Asia isn't always comfortable with. So it may be unrealistic to expect that you get the same sort of innovation in, in, uh, in Asian environments, but you can get other, so other sorts of innovation, and, and indeed you do. I think you get the sort of constant iterative improvement of existing ideas Right. and also the take-up of, of other, other people's ideas with extreme vigor and often great effectiveness. And that's not to be scoffed at, because that's good copying or good take, borrowing of ideas and then taking them forward to the next stage. Uh, that, that's, that can be very effective as a, as, a, as a business model and as a way of serving customers. In your The World In, uh, I believe I'm right in saying that you, you, you had predicted the importance of, of mm. social media. So as we look into 2013 and some of the things that you see, um, what are the other big trends, social-related trends? Well, I think one that I would highlight in particular, because it's, uh, <coughs> I think, a particularly interesting and important one, that 2013 may be the, the year or is likely to be the year where the Internet becomes a mainly mobile medium. Right. And now, by that, what I mean is that the number of Internet-connected devices that are mobile so smartphones, um, iPads, and so on, outnumber, will for the first time outnumber the fixed connections, right. to PCs and so on, right. to the Internet. You know, that's happened in a relatively short space of time for the, for the Internet as a, as a, as a medium. It, happened, it took 126 years or so for the telephone to get from fixed to mainly mobile. It's happening in just a few decades for the Internet. And actually, it has very big um, repercussions. You know, this is a trend that will only grow in importance over, over the coming years. Uh, it has big repercussions, first of all, for the companies that are, for the tech companies that are um, active in, in providing internet-related services. So certain ones that are particularly good at mobile will do well. Certain ones that are, uh, have, have thrived in the fixed world but aren't necessarily well adapted for mobile. So, so, so examples? So, so Apple, was, I think, is very well placed for the right. mobile world. Um, HP would be an example of a company which may struggle because it's made, made, uh, made it, or Dell, which has made uh, desktop computers um, and, and isn't necessarily going to be as pioneering in the internet world. And then there is a great sort of middle ground of companies that could go either way. I think Facebook is a good example of mm -hmm. that, which was actually designed for a fixed internet world, right. but is having to adapt very quickly to a mobile uh, a, a mobile world. And then it goes well beyond that, I think, to all sorts of businesses, which, including, by the way, my own uh, media businesses, which have to think much harder about how they start to, to design their products for a mobile first world rather than a fixed world. But, so we already had one big transformation when the world woke up to the importance of the internet itself. And now there's another one where you wake up to the importance of the mobile internet. You design things for the mobile screen. You, you, you imagine your uh, consumers consuming on the, on the move and in fact you know the internet isn't a place that you go to it's it's increasingly something that is always with, with, you, with as you, you as you carry it yeah. with you yeah so yeah. I think you know n next year is a year where that starts to uh, become the the norm and people begin to realize it more and more I mean it's very difficult to get people to to value high quality content do you find uh, that? Well, I don't think the two are incompatible. I mean, I think it's, I would describe Gangnam Style as, as high quality content in its own way. It's sure. fantastic that sure. something uh, like that comes out of nowhere from South Korea and, and is hugely successful around the world and indeed unleashes a, a sort of second wave of creativity with people doing sort of, so, you know, that's, that, that's great. But I, I think actually there is an appetite for high quality content, but it, it has to fit in with people's lifestyles in, 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 in whatever uh, form it's delivered. So right. um, I, 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 I would be optimistic about actually 
probably a growing appetite in all sorts of ways of, of, for, for quite sophisticated content because I think there are growing numbers of people around the world who are actually pick and choose consumers will, will, will happily consume both uh, popular culture mm. and uh, go to museums and uh, go to the cinema to see live opera um, and hopefully read The Economist. The evolution of uh, social media and working with a lot of our clients, there, there was the obsessive need uh, to build communities. So what are some of the things that you would say to um, a a any client with, with a big community that they need to be mindful of in terms of content? For us, um, for, our, for our own content, what, what's been important is to stay true to ourselves in right. various outlets that we, that we do, whether it's online or whether it's on a, a, a tablet platform or indeed whether it's live events, extreme consciousness of, of um, what we do, the values that we bring to, 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 to content. Right. Um, so I think probably in, a, in, in most contexts the, the audience or the community will suss out if you're not being true to yourself. So th that's, that seems to me to be pretty fundamental whatever you're doing. So, so the authenticity part of it um, but being absolutely crucial, how, how you run your business and obviously into, into how you're expressing yourself, engaging. Yes, and I guess if you have a community, you know, the community is there for a reason. They expect to be right. to commune around a certain idea or a certain yeah. style, and if you're not true to that style, they'll wonder what they're doing there. Yeah. It does seem that an, an SME is obviously being so important uh, across Asia, representing anything between 65 and 90 percent of, uh, of businesses across Asia. Mm -hmm. What do you think SMEs can be thinking about um, in terms of, of them as they structure their business, of, of taking advantage of all of the societal change, the technology change, um, and, and the opportunity to be, to be unencumbered by size almost? Yes. Well, there are, I think it is an exciting time to, to, to be um, starting a business and to, to, to be an SME with, if you're in a sort of business that could have potential audiences anywhere because the platforms exist to go global in a way that, that didn't exist before. So you right. can have Gangnam Style going around the world, for example, right. uh, I I in no time at all. And you can be a small business and have a, have, a, have a worldwide platform and nobody really knows you're a small business. You're mm. just what's presenting itself on, uh, on global, not, not just actually presenting yourselves, but possibly sourcing your materials from anywhere in the world because that's now increasingly easy. So I think those, that potential to have um, the world as your oyster is greater than it has ever been. The final thing I, I, I've got for you, if I may, my congratulations, 30 years you're celebrating next year that you, you've, you've been with The Economist. Mm -hmm. What would you choose to do in 2013 or in the next decade um, if you were you, if you were going to look for something other than The Economist and other than journalism, what would it be? First of all, I've been extremely lucky to, with these past 30 years. I, I think I, I would love to um, do something, if I were to start over again, to do something creative, first of all. And that creativity could be in any number of areas. But I, 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 would, I would like to think I would have have the courage to be an entrepreneur next time around um, and, and to, to really create a business and, and moreover to create a global business because I think that might be, uh, would be a very exciting thing to do. It's, it's wonderful that you uh, sort of recognize creativity as we, we talk about th th this, the importance of creativity in business uh, and should you decide to do that Daniel, please let Ogilvy know because we'd <laughs> love to, to, to work with you and help you on that. Thank you very much <laughs> Thank indeed. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot.